Thank you for the invitation. This is a chapter of a book that's supposed to be published this fall. And, uh, well, this is the motto for this particular chapter. Uh, individuals who never sense the contradictions of their cultural inheritance on the risk of becoming little more than host bodies for stale gestures, metaphors, and received ideas. And this is from Lewis Hyde's Fixture Makes This World. I apologize for that. This formatting has changed. Uh, this is a book that I, I consulted after I'd written the first version uh, of this chapter. And it actually has a lot to do with mathematics. So this is an experiment, first in what we might call mathematical anthropology, except I'm not an anthropologist, in the sense of examining the symbolic role of a notion that uh, is not so often uh, examined by philosophers, or maybe never, in this case, tricks. I was able to find any, I was able to find exactly one uh, article about tricks online. Nothing to talk about it. Uh, in alluding indirectly to controversies about epistemology of mathematics, I'm not going to say anything explicit, but you'll probably notice it in the background. This is, uh, I want to emphasize, this is not a scholarly study. I found a, a, a bunch of information and I put it together in a way that pleased me, but maybe someday there will be a mathematical anthropologist who will be able to make use of this. That's also an experiment in presenting my book, it's the first time I've done this. And then also, uh, in the end, the last third or so, situating mathematics within the broader culture. So, this begins three times. The first uh, is a quotation from a paper uh, that was announced to me in early 2010 by Toby G, who has uh, uh, given me the honor of, of attending this, this talk. Uh, he, he thanks the, the authors of this paper, thank me for my tensor product trick. All right, so there's a question that comes along with this, if you're sensitive to terminology. How did they know it was a trick? <laughs> this is a question that has an easy answer, because in the paper, the recording, I said, the principal innovation is a tensor product trick that does whatever it does. So then comes the hard part. How did I know it was a trick? <laughs> uh, and that's what this, this chapter is basically about. I still don't really know. What did it have in common with other famous tricks, such as Maybe the most famous is Cantor's diagonalization trick, which everybody knows. Vial's unitarian trick, which is actually due to uh, Horvitz and, and Shor, but it's always due to Vial. Then various tricks I learned when I was a student. Lieberman's trick, Rabinovich's trick, and the eilenberg Maser trick, also called the eilenberg Maser swindle. <laughs> and more recently, uh, a group of mathematicians, including Tim Gowers, started something called the Tricks Wiki, or Tricky, uh, that was supposed to be a repository of mathematical tricks. Apparently it has gone dormant. Nothing has been added in a year or two. So, to start to try to identify what are tricks, first, what is not a trick? Well, what people usually talk about when they talk about mathematics. A straightforward calculation, a syllogism, standard estimates, nor reference to literature. Of course. So, is there, can I be more precise about this? No. No, no mathematics with a capital M, uh, idealized mathematics, is neatly divided among axioms, definitions, theorems, and proofs. But the mathematics of mathematicians, the discomfort of philosophers going back to, to Plato, at least blurs taxonomical boundaries. So, to, to quote uh, Hyde, a mathematical trick, like a trickster, is a notorious crosser of conventional borders. The lord of in-between, in the words of, of Hyde, like the devil who taught Robert Johnson to play the guitar, who dwells at the crossroads. A mathematical trick simultaneously disturbs the settled order and, as in Hyde's title, makes this world. So, what may be a trick? Well, here are some guesses, but there are no more than that. A trick involves drawing attention to an intrinsic element of a mathematical situation that appears to be, but is not in fact irrelevant to the problem of under, conversation, uh, under consideration. But this subordinates the trick to a pre-existing problem. So, one could also say that it provides an unexpected point of contact, just like a play on words, 
between two domains not previously known to be related. Now, um, mathematicians have ambivalent feelings about tricks. And this is reflected in the uh, semantics, the words used, uh, the sense of getting something for nothing. So, a Dutch colleague uh, told me that the word used for trick is truc, which is spelled two different ways. And it's mostly used in, um, in connection with magicians and card tricks. This is the word. So, a truc by its nature cannot be something very serious. And that word serious, you should take it seriously because it's, uh, it's going to return. The Russian word is tryuk, which I was only able to trace back to the early part of the 20th century, and in other settings it can mean deceit or craftiness. The French word is very common, it's astuce, and it has had positive connotations since the 19th century, but until then it uh, was not at all considered positive. And here's a quotation from Orelme, the 14th century, if the intention is bad, such a a, a power is called an astuce or a malicious thing. Uh, the most, the word I'm going to be exploring the most is uh, Kunstgriff. Uh, contemporary Germans usually use the word trick in other anglicisms, but they still do occasionally say Kunstgriff, and this is the traditional term. Now, this has, to show you that this also has ambivalent connotations, Schopenhauer used the word Kunstgriff in a posthumous uh, public, posthumous publication where it signifies a dishonest trick for winning arguments. Okay. So, now here's a, I just want to put this in. Um, for, as a contribution to the uh, debate between realists and nominalists, here's, I propose that tricks show that uh, mathematics may have something to do with magic realism. Uh, if mathematics, in the, in the, in the, uh, as idealized by logical and empiricist philosophers, is insensitive to the complex interplay of delight, as in a neat trick, and this day, as in a cheap trick, that accompanies uh, the revelation of a new mathematical trick, it constitutes a perfect moment of pleasure, like Garcia Marquez's reaction, nearly falling out of bed, when he read the first sentence of Kafka's Metamorphosis, saying, I didn't know you were allowed to write like that. <laughs> that's, what, that's what a trick does to a mathematician. Uh, so now, on the question of whether high and low culture in mathematics. Uh, again, ambivalence shows up already. This is in the math American Mathematical Monthly. Uh, you can see, they were, they were discouraging the use of tricks for teachers because it, because because it seems to be only another trick where why we should be discouraged. And again, most of us teach in a way that discourage students, uh, giving them the impression that excellence in mathematical science is a matter of trick methods. So the mathematicians are in fact magicians. On the other hand, in advice to authors, uh, the American Mathematical Society, the other society in the States, says the tricks are worth writing down, whereas the routine computations should be eliminated. So, so which is it? All right, I, I'm not a scholar, but I was able to use Google and various other, uh, other search devices to find a trick, and this is the earliest one I could find in a published article. Uh, that really is a trick. So this is from Moritz Abraham Stern's article on, on Continued Fractions, published in Crella's journal in 1833. Crella is the oldest continuing the still published journal still pu in publication. In all the transformations, one applied the Kunstgriff of treating a part of the continued fraction as if it were sum, designating this sum by letter. It's not such a hard trick, but it's a recognizable trick. There are also, the word Kunstgriff appears uh, more than a dozen times in uh, uh, Kessner's History of Mathematics of 1796, and I just discovered that the other day because I couldn't find them when I first looked. And I, it, I'm not quite sure whether these are really tricks in the contemporary sense. The next Kunstgriff in Krella was in an article by Lipschitz in 1869. So there were not so many of them. Now there are tricks in every single issue of every single journal. In the two most prestigious U.S. journals, 
of the early first part of the 20th century, both of them, it turns out, were identified as such by Hermann Weil. So in the annals of math, he has a trick in differential equations, in 1935. And in a dynamical systems question, I transform the expression, which our method immediately leads by a very simple trick in the American Journal of Mathematics, 1839. I was unable to find any earlier uh, reference to the word trick in journals, which is also surprising. Now, before we dig a little bit deeper, I want to contrast the trickster with other personalities uh, one encounters in mathematics. So, and these are the ones that remain within the conventional orders. So, first, the lower order, the lumberjack. This is a, a, a quotation well known to everybody in Langlands' field, but I think it's not as well known as it deserves to be. Early on in his, in his uh, description of the program, part of a program that lasted about 35 years until it was completed, we are in a forest whose trees will not fall with a few timid hatchet blows. We have to take up the double-bitted axe and the cross-cut saw. I've been told by people who've used the double-bitted axe, it's really not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> one, bit, one bit is much better, and, and hopefully our muscles are equal to them. Now, those maybe you know that Langland is from the uh, west of Canada, and his father worked in, uh, in a sawmill, not as a late. But anyway, <laughs> he, he seems to have some re regrets at having been uh, Then, Grotendieck. These are the two sort of framing characters of, of my book. I talked about the Batisseur in his, in his uh, unpublished and unpublishable memoirs. He, the, the builder has only two hands like everyone, but two hands that do not shrink from the toughest jobs nor from the most delicate. So this is, this is the class. Then the philosopher. Um, the word philosophy is often associated with Langlands and some other mathematicians, and I asked Castleman, who was one of his associates, why the word philosophy had dropped out of use. He said, well, it was fashionable in 67 when Langlands began to formulate his, his uh, conjectures, and less so in 1979. In fact, there are still people who talk about Langlands philosophers. There were lots of philosophies, I don't know what the other ones were uh, at the time. The yogi. Grotendieck, I used the word, introduced the word yoga into Bourbaki mathematics, and all his students and his, his associates use it regularly. And what he meant by this is a point of view, a unifying point of view, a direction, a research direction in for the search of concepts and proofs and a method that could be reused. Used. And this is Cartier, one of Grotendieck's closest collaborators. Now, in between the routine and the exalted, one finds the level of normal mathematical problem solving, and it's not uh, significant that the descriptions are dominated by the vocabulary of combat. The words like strategy, attack, and brute force, for example. Now, if you're thinking along anthropological lines, then you, will, you may find a, a <laughs> parallel with Georges Dumézil's tri-functional theory of Indo-European mythology. So this is the this is the application to to uh, Hindu mythology, where the the Brahmins are the philosophers and the yogis, the Kshatriyas are responsible for strategy and attack, and the the two lower varnas are car correspond to the production of wealth. And this he finds it across uh, a hypothesis, but a robust hypothesis that he finds across Indo-European cultures from the British Isles to, to, to ancient Rome and North Assyria. Now, but if you find that far, analogy far-fetched, here is Bourbaki's architecture of mathematics. These structures are tools for the mathematician as soon as he, well, that's Bourbaki, has recognized relations which satisfy the axioms of a known type as at his disposal immediately the entire arsenal of general theorems. Previously, he was obliged to forge for himself the means of attack. One could say that the axiomatic method is nothing but the Taylor system for mathematics. This is, a, this is one of Bourbaki's most important programmatic statements. And there you've got the lower orders, but having 
exhibited the mathematician as a blacksmith, an assembly line worker, as well as a military strategist. The first of the three functions is remind is recalled in the next very next paragraph. It's a poor analogy. The mathematician does not work like a machine or working on a moving belt. The, we cannot overemphasize the fundamental role played by special intuition, not a kind of direct divination of the intuitive course of this thought illuminating with a new lens, like the mathematical landscape. So here's the trifunctionalism. But where does the trickster fit in with this picture? Actually, Yungmezir wrote a separate book about Loki, and I have not been able to find any synthesis in which it's Loki in with the three functions. Well, one can, there are many objections to the trifunctional model. It's just to say it's frivolous, but one objection is that it's hardly the only activity to which it can be applied. The distinctiveness of mathematics may lie in its characteristic tricks. Unlike business, which has a management philosophy, a commercial strategy, marketing tools, or politics, which has philosophy of government, or political strategy, and techniques of communication, mathematics has no place for dirty tricks. Here's a quotation from my, one of my colleagues in Paris. As mathematicians, we play and dream, but we don't cheat. I think the whole book of philosophy could be devoted to explicating that very, very that sentiment. Now, trying to trace back the source of tricks, uh, with the help of one of my colleagues in Paris, I was led to El Farabi's Catalog of the Sciences, uh, 10th century uh, catalog, uh, science. Uh, he listed algebra not as a freestanding branch of mathematics like arithmetic and geometry, which he followed Aristotle, but rather alongside mechanical devices in a final section on Elmahia, which means the science of Elhia. It's the plural word of the equivalent of the Greek mechane. That's, how it was, that's one of the translations of mechane, which is translated alternatively as ingenious devices, mechanics, or tricks. And in contemporary Arabic, it still means trick is still one of the meanings. And I, a hundred years earlier, the Banu Musa brothers had published something called Kitab al which is a catalog of mechanical devices, including automata. Now here, here, is the, here is the section. So there, there are seven branches of mathematics in this mathematical chapter. They are the familiar ones, arithmetic, geometry, optics, astronomy, music, weights, and then this is al uh, This is a whole section, a couple pages on it. And here is the here are the is the passage. The only translations I found of this are in Spanish and Latin, and I don't read Latin. But the uh, this this section says among them, it's, it's not the Spanish is not quite right. Among them are numerical tricks and the science known to us as algebra. That's the call it a trick. Now, why why was algebra a trick? Well, for Aristotelians. And for medieval Arab philosophers who followed Aristotle, the algebra of al could not be a science because it applied indiscriminately to arithmetic and geometry, and the science for Aristotle was defined by its domain of application. And in uh, his book of science, uh, Avicenna, one century later, listed geometry, astronomy, arithmetic, and music in mathematics amongst branches of mathematics, but included algebra as the secondary part of arithmetic. Omar al-Khayyam, who was an algebraist, thought otherwise. He had a few uh, intemperate statements, and this is one of them in his rare surviving works. This is the only time he used the word trick. Um, his works, the words are cataloged. Those who think algebra is a trick to determine unknown numbers think the unthinkable. Therefore, you must not pay attention to those who judge by appearances. <laughs> um, the other, the, the, another time he gets angry is about something very similar. Well, all right. Now, you can also go backwards. So, here, as I said, translates Mekane in the same way that Elma translates Epistemi. And Plutarch's 
Now here, Plutarch's account of Plato's rejection of mechanical methods in mathematics, as quoted in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's uh, entry on Archytas, uh, calls this a sort of foundation myth for the science of mechanics, which explained the separation of mechanics from philosophy as the result of a quarrel between two philosophers. But going forward, and here things get really uh, more obscure, in the Latin version of uh, Al Farabi's catalog, translated by Gerardo Cremona, El Nachial is translated Ingeniorum Scientia, which means the science of ingenium, which is also the Latin equivalent of mechanic. But ingenium also figured in Latin texts of mathematics, as well as in the title of Descartes' Rules for the Direction of the Ingenium. And among its many German translations, one of them is Kunstgriff. And somebody else will have to figure out if there's really a connection. But we know that the word ingenium is associated with engineering, with machines for engineering, but also with genius. This places it at both ends of the trifunctional scale. And this neatly mirrors mathematicians' ambivalence to tricks, and incidentally suggests that anything in mathematical and mechanical theorem prover it proved would automatically be a trick. Now, Bourbaki didn't like tricks. Not even, some Bourbakis do, but Bourbaki has the architecture of mathematics in any case, did not. The axiomatic method, which is the centerpiece of Bourbaki, has as its cornerstone the conviction that not only is mathematics not a randomly developing concatenation of syllogisms, but it's nor is it a collection of more or less astute tricks which truly technical cleverness wins the day. So, taking all this into account, my provisional hypothesis is that the mathematical trickster, like the mythological trickster, serves as a bridge between high and low genres. Here are some examples. Uh, Krishna is both uh, the god Vishnu and his human avatar. Prometheus brought fire from heaven to earth. These are, so these, some of these are, are from, from Hyde's book. Hermes is both the messenger of the gods and the soul's guide. The underworld, Mephistopheles, plays both sides in the Faust legend. And, it's an interesting one, the Yoruba divine trickster Esu was not only was in both, was in both realms, but he even limped because his legs were of different lengths. One up and one below. So, the mathematical trick predates logicist of formalist idealizations, uh, bypasses the idealized route from human practice to the inscription of theorems in the eternal register. So here's the second beginning. Here's a question. How to explain the persistent tendency to class mathematics as a high genre, this is related to the first talk, along with the fine arts and specifically with classical music and by extension, to consider tricks illegitimate. There are popular books about the affinity, supposed affinity between mathematics and music, and here the usual, the usual references: Pythagoras, the Quadrivium, Kepler, Leibniz. So the music is an unconscious exercise in arithmetic. Rameau based his music theory on, on mathematics, and then one one brings in anecdotes about contemporary musically gifted mathematicians. What is not mentioned so often is that at most times the affinity between mathematics and serious music was markedly one-sided. And here, here's some evidence of that. So here's some quotations from the 18th and 19th century. I have many more. C.P.E. Bach writing about his father particularly in reference to Rameau. The departed was like myself or any true musician, no lover of dry mathematical stuff. <laughs> Saint-Saëns writing about Berlioz, one doesn't learn art as one learns mathematics. One could, one could um, write a vast amount on tricks in Bach. Well, that's <laughs> also true, but, to, uh, but that is not what one emphasizes when one points the supposed affinity between them. Well, I know, but I don't think exactly, you know, but, but, but you know, one, could, one could surely make a counter -argument. Well, I don't know whether but, but you, right I don't know whether musicologists would. Uh, I don't know. I don't know of any any studies. Here's one from 1900 
from the Pall Mall Gazette. The Brahms sextet was written in order to prove how excellent a mathematician he might have become, but how, how hopeless, unfeeling, unemotional Arab musician he really was. <laughs> Sirs, quadratic equations, hyperbolic curves, the dynamics of a particle, but music is not only a science, it is also an art. This is the only, it could be played, it's the only way you can work out a problem in musical trigonometry. And it continues. <laughs> it continues. Do you know this? This is the uh, enfant des sorties So the, the, the naughty child is being tortured, and here's where he's being tortured by arithmetic. See, there's that. This is a, a, a faucet problem. At the beginning, you notice the, the interesting arithmetic. Could you sing? What? Could you sing? I cannot <laughs> sing that. No, I cannot sing it. Unfortunately, I, well, we'll see. And I, if I had known that I could do something, then I would. So here's, here's, here are two reviews, recent reviews, one from the London Review and one from the Telegraph. Schoenberg's pieces of that time were hardly pure mathematics. Once you're inside music, all thoughts about mathematics become irrelevant. Now, don't you think there's something pathetic about how certain mathematicians keep insisting that they are artists, <laughs> and the artists are always wanting to run the other way? I think it's incredibly pathetic how some artists want to insist they're mathematicians. But so, now, so the question asked by the joker, why so serious? Well, there's a generic answer that applies to all professors. The professor represents the university, the university is a locus of power, and power demands to be taken seriously. But here are three hypothetical answers that apply specifically to, math to mathematics. First, the theological answer. Uh, the word mathematicus, up through the time of Kepler and Galileo, was used primarily for astrologers, including Kepler and Galileo, and Kepler's job description was Mathematicus. And here's another interesting example. This is from the Faust book. Uh, Dr. Faustus was decided he wasn't going to be a theologian anymore. He wanted to become a man of the world, called himself a doctor of medicine, an astrologer, and a Mathematicus. If you want to know what a Mathematicus looks like. Here's a painting <laughs> from the, uh, that's in, by Luca Giordano in the Museum of Buenos Aires, and you can see this, this Mathematicus is, is holding a book with mystical symbols uh, that have not, I have not seen anybody quite identify them. It's called a Mathematico, it's translated a mathematician, but it could just as well have been called a Mathematicus. Now here are some more, maybe more familiar examples. John Dee uh, has there's a quotation in which he talks about Mathematics as a bridge between things supernatural, immortal, intellectual, simply indivisible, and then things natural, mortal, sensible, compound, and indivisible. The higher and the lower. And here's a recent study of Giordano Bruno, which the author claims that mathematics is meant to be a link between the celestial and the terrestrial. Both dubious personalities at the time. Second, the ontological answer. Here's a well-known quotation from G. H. Hardy, um, who, in, in, uh, in Hacking's forthcoming book, is blamed for causing, creating a lot of confusion among philosophers. <laughs> the serious, among other things, the seriousness of a mathematical theorem lies in the significance of the mathematical ideas which it connotes. It's, this is, in some ways, actually very rich because every one of the terms can be can be picked apart. But here's an anecdote that illustrates. Uh, ambulance. So, when the Dean proved the last of the vapor injectors in 1973, it was a, one of the high points of 20th century mathematics, and in particular it was the culmination of Grotendieck's program. He had spent 15 years or more developing a new framework with 13 steps to leading the top to the proof of the vapor injectors, and he, he would have al been already uh, withdrawn from mathematics. He made a special trip back. And then the Lean reports the result. If I had done it using motives, he would have been very interested because of the meant theory of motives that had been developed. But since the proof used a trick, he did not care. <laughs> now this, actually, Serre and Rotendieck exchanged some, some uh, correspondence on this because Serre wrote in one of his letters, 
you find this shocking, but I love it. <laughs> this is, this is an important personality difference. Uh, there's another, another approach, Langlands. You see what Dereen did was use some ideas that he learned from Langlands. And uh, Langlands said perhaps, a lot of people were, were impressed by this. Perhaps he could have drawn a different conclusion if he had known Langlands theory. Uh, see, the Dean's proof was based, this is, this is typically modest, uh, of Langlands' part. It was based on profound understanding of the atomic homology theory. That's what Langlands didn't do, accompanied by an observation arising in the theory of automorphic forms. That's what Langlands did do. In fact, what he did was he realized that as a consequence of Langlands' framework, this was a natural, a natural approach to the work. So which goes to show that trickiness is not an intrinsic, much less quantifiable property of mathematical text. Now the socio-political answer, and this yes, I'm, I've gone over, I believe, but, and I haven't, all right, but uh, Herbert Merton's book on modernization stresses the aspirations of seriousness were integral to the modernization process. A quotation about Till Eulenspiegel. The German, but moreover, the German modernizers in mathematics were explicitly uh, making parallels between their goals and those of their artistic contemporaries. They were aspiring to being taken seriously. There's a, there's a quotation he quoted when he described mathematics as a free creative art. He explicitly uh, cited the Berliner secessionist painter Max Lieberman. And the idea was to become free, to have the autonomous to define their own criteria of quality. So, here's the third version. Um, I was at the Institute for Advanced Study in the spring of 2011, and the artist in residence, who was a classically trained clarinetist, gave a kind of informal lecture, and he performed these lines by Rakim. Excuse me. And again. So this is this is a clip from Eric B. and Joaquin. I asked myself, is the Institute for Advanced Study no longer guarding the border between high and low culture? <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out so that this uh, rockers don't like math very much either. So here is there's something called math rock. I got some information about this from from Toby G. Who, gave, who directed me to this quotation, which has been taken offline. Uh, the group Battles are, were considered a leading representative of math rock, but they hated math. And this is, uh, they, they couldn't do anything about the, the, uh, the title. Here's another, there's a song called Mathematics, Cold Mathematics, and there's called Mathematics, Equations Pass Me By, <laughs> Patty Smith, uh, it's the Mathematics of Our Desire, there's no equation to explain it. And here are some titled an algebra, with algebra, and if you look at the words, you will see that none of them has anything very good to say about algebra, about mathematics, and then it goes on like this. But African-American popular musicians do like mathematics. So here's George, George Clinton's mathematics, they respect mathematics, let's say. Mathematics of love, like any percentage, it's not really very sophisticated mathematics. <laughs> Uh, any percentage of you is as good as the whole pie, and any fraction thereof brings dividends of love. Tanya West, you don't need a curriculum to know that you are a part of the math. And most definitely. And this is uh, this is if you if you Google mathematics, if you look at mathematics on YouTube, at this. It's most likely to be your first. <laughs> now, there's a, there is a logical explanation that doesn't really explain very much. A, a sect, or, or maybe an offshoot rather, the nation of Islam called the Nation of Gods and Earths, or Five Percenters, that has this cosmology 
organized around something called supreme mathematics and the supreme alphabet. And it's supposed to happen that Rakim and members of the Wu-Tang clan were uh, associated with, explicitly with the nation of gods and earth. And one of the founders of the Wu-Tang clan called himself mathematics and wrote this to explain why he did so. Mathematics is the universal language. It can cross barriers of language, color, religion. It's, it's brought, it, it dwells at the crossroads. Now, uh, to conclude, um, mathematics is in the mind. If advocates of elite culture disdain rock and rap, it's because they are said to appeal to the body's lower sectors, unlike classical music. This is already uh, in uh, Gauss admired the poem uh, Archimedes and the Apprentice of Schiller, which features the line, He who woos the goddess, seek in her not the maid. And uh, Bertrand Russell, well known quotation, mathematics, a means of creating and sustaining a lofty habit of mind, that's quoted in by Hardy, in which he adds, like poetry or music. And this can be traced back to, like most, most uh, obnoxious ideas, to uh, Plato, uh, <laughs> mathematical knowledge is stored in the soul, it, involving the body makes the soul confused and dizzy like a drunken man. But where is the mind? This is a, an affirmation of elite culture by Pierre Boulez. Just, uh, <coughs> um, I believe in aristocracy, I believe in elite culture. Whereas Derek Bermel told me, strong and mediocre music can be found in any genre. What matters is what Bermel calls coherence of structure, which is very similar to what the Oxford musicologist uh, Lawrence Pfeiffer's uh, all the respect for the inherent meaningfulness of the world, which describes the recognition of how freedom, freedom and necessity are inextricably linked, which again bridges the high and low. Now, even those musicians who express admiration for mathematicians do not welcome us as fellow artists. But bearing in mind, to quote, quote uh, Henry Louis Gates, that signifying, that is, what the trickster does is the grandfather, grandparent of rap, and that is, and that, 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 and and we see them. I, and, and yes, there I have, the word trick, and then what is what kind of thing is a trick? I call it a, it's an intentional relational mathematical intervention, or a gesture, a speech act, an invention. I don't know what what are they, what is the genus to which the species trick belongs. The intention may be to approve or to disapprove. However, they're usually considered a source of pleasure. Whether, whether ticks are more pleasurable than rigorous, rigorous formalization is an open question. Well, actually, it's not an open question. But, <laughs> but, but if, uh, if, we have, if we include mechanical theorem improvements, as uh, we try to uh, imagine they also feel pleasurable, we have to be open minded. And then, a philosophy of mathematics that plays tricks on an equal footing with formal rigor would probably look very different from what is currently practiced in most university departments. Thank you.